You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome to the palatial broadcasting studios of The Corbett Report in Western Japan. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is the 2nd of February 2018, and it is that time that you have been waiting for anxiously for a week and a half now. That's right, the real fake news awards. As I'm sure you saw on my announcement on this channel about a week and a half ago before I was so rudely interrupted by a particularly nasty flu bug, this is the real fake news awards, i.e. those fake news awards given to clunker fake news stories over the past year that has nothing to do with the left-right phony divide, and this is not GOP-approved, Republican-sponsored awards of any sort. This is really going to run the gamut of some of the worst fake news stories of the past year. And as you saw in that announcement, no doubt, I did call on the participation of the listeners and viewers out there, so I'm very glad to see that the Corporate Report members did log onto the site and leave their nominations in droves. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of nominations for fake news stories of the year, and obviously we cannot do injustice to all of them tonight. Uh, we cannot dishonor all of them. Uh, so I will suggest that you go and take a look at that announcement and at the dozens and dozens of suggestions that Corporate Report members left in the comment section there for fake news stories of the year. We're just going to highlight a few of the worst offenders uh, tonight. And, and they run quite a large range of different types of stories in different areas. So I think it's an interesting little experiment, and this is the first annual, so I'm sure many more to come, unless there's no more fake news being published over the next year. Yeah, right. Well, at any rate, I think since this is the first annual Real Fake News Awards, I think the first order of business should be to give these awards a name. Because, yes, Oscar, Grammy, Emmy, all of these statuettes that are given out to the Hollywood royalty are always named with these cutesy-poo names. Well, let's give a name to the Fake News Awards, and I suggest Dinos. That's right, we are going to be bestowing Dinos on the Fake News Stories of the Year, because the vast majority of the entries today, although not all of them, but the vast majority of them do come from the dinosaur establishment fossilized media that does not yet even realize that it has ma been made extinct by the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer global revolution that is taking place online that is smashing through the establishment dinosaur lies in ways that I'm sure they still don't even quite comprehend. So I think the dinos is an appropriate moniker for this award, these awards that we're going to be bestowing on the clunker stories of the year tonight, as this awards ceremony. And the very first award tonight is the Fake Eco Scare of the Year Award, which goes to National Geographic for heart-wrenching video shows starving polar bear on iceless land. From December 7th, 2017, just squeaking in under, under the wire there for nomination for the 2017 Fake News Awards. This article read in part, quote, When photographer Paul Nicklin and filmmakers from conservation group Sea Legacy arrived on Somerset Island, near the largest Baffin Island, in late summer, they came across a heartbreaking sight, a starving polar bear on its deathbed. We stood there crying, filming with tears rolling down our cheeks, he said. Video shows the polar bear clinging to life, its white hair limply covering its thin bony frame. One of the bear's back legs drags behind it as it walks, like, likely due to muscle atrophy. Looking for food, the polar bear slowly rummages through a nearby trash can used seasonally by Inuit fishers. It finds nothing and resignedly collapses back down onto the ground. By telling the story of one polar bear, Nicklin hopes to convey a larger message about how a warming climate has deadly consequences. Okay, well, thank you for that stinker of a story, National Geographic. And it wasn't long before the backlash against this story started, not just in the, the, uh, the alternative media, the independent media, but all over the establishment media, people were calling out this story as a steaming pile of refuse. Total fake news. 
top to bottom. And this, as I say, was being called out everywhere, from CBC News to everywhere else, as being a very big put-on. And it should come as no surprise to Corbett Report members that a story about the cute and cuddly polar bears that would rip your face off if they had a chance uh, are the oh poor put upon victims of man-made climate change oh won't somebody think of the polar bears you might remember this tragic little scene from the inconvenient truth <clears throat> of Al Gore, where he shows this and, and narrates about, oh, these polar bears are starting to drown because they can't swim because they're looking for sea pack ice that's melting in the Arctic. Oh, you know, look at this. This is, this is proof <laughs> that polar bears are, are drowning and dying. And this was based on the work of Charles Monnet and uh, Jeffrey S. Gleason in an article that was published in 2006, Observations of Mortality Associated with Extended Open Water Swimming by Polar Bears in the Alaskan Beaufort Sea, which was in fact the first ever, the only ever recorded instance of this in the scientific literature where they're recording the, the amount of uh, bears that drowned at sea as a result of sea ice loss, which is actually, if you go and read the paper, is completely hypothetical. It's completely their, uh, their assumptions. Uh, they observed 55 polar bears, 51 were alive, and of those, uh, 10 were in open water. In addition, four polar bear carcasses were seen floating in open water and had presumably drowned <laughs> and presumably drowned because of man-made global warming which is the other uh, leap of logic in this paper where of course there had been a major storm shortly before those four dead polar bears were found but according to the author of this paper Charles Manette the, the storm had not, probably had nothing to do with the, the death of these bears so again all of this was based on this and the funniest well I mean there's a lot of funny parts to this but one is that this was published in 2006 before anyone had any idea really what the swimming range of polar bears were because no one had ever uh, accurately tracked it before. This is noting that uh, the polar bears swimming in open water in 2004 were swimming 8.3 plus or minus 3.0 uh, uh, kilometers to uh, to land and 177.4 plus or minus 5.1 kilometers to the uh, pack ice edge. Well, in 2008, they actually did radio collar a uh, polar bear and found that it made a continuous swim of 687 kilometers over nine days. A continuous swim of 687 kilometers. Yes, polar bears can swim hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. So this is largely bogus. And, uh, well, people might know that Charles Monette was actually suspended over the uh, the d dead polar bears report and was investigated for those claims. But don't worry, he was cleared uh, for any scientific misconduct regarding them. I'll throw in a transcript to the hearing where he was grilled about this paper. It's quite, quite humorous, especially where he claims the storm, yeah, the storm had nothing to do with the deaths of these polar bears. But that was enough to ingrain the polar bear as one of the iconic symbols of global warming, the global warming ambassador to the world, so that now... For example, ooh, an ice sculpture uh, polar bear uh, is melting in the middle of Montreal, therefore man-made climate change. Or uh, Science Magazine a few years ago had this hand ringy op-ed about climate change and the integrity of science. We are deeply disturbed by the recent escalation of political assaults on scientists in general and on climate scientists in particular. A report that they originally uh, illustrated with this quote-unquote photograph, which isn't a photograph at all, but a Photoshop. <laughs> they eventually had to retract this, saying the original image associated with this letter was not a photograph, but a collage. <laughs> the image was selected by the editors, and it was a mistake to have used it. So again, the polar bear floating the, out there in the ice, stranded out on the ice, what's it going to do, is fake, and is constantly used as the image to make us believe in this global warming scare. And then there's just garbage nonsense like this with these polar bears, these bloody polar bears falling from the sky in this commercial. And it's, I mean, it it's even more bizarre. I want to go through all the bloody details of this ridiculous nonsense, but it's even more bizarre when you find out they're not even talking necessarily about polar bears dying because of man-made global warming, but because an average flight produces over 400 kilograms of greenhouse gases for every passenger, which is the same the weight of an adult polar bear. So I guess this is meant to represent a flight, <laughs> a flight to Europe, but uh, it, it just all becomes all tossed up into this salad of, of confusion and nonsense about the polar bears and, oh, what are they going to do? 
Ah, uh, yes, and as always, right there at ground zero of the uh, eco-climate scare uh, is the fake news stories about polar bears. So no surprise whatsoever that the fake eco-scare of the year award goes to a fake polar bear story for 2017 as well. And for people who are actually interested in the science about polar bears and what the actual science says, I would really suggest you go back and watch that full video that we just watched that little clip of, Won't Somebody Think of the Polar Bears, uh, in which I go into great detail about the IUCN endangered species list and how they uh, labeled the polar bear population as vulnerable and why that's completely, flatly, 100% contradicted by the science itself. It's an in-depth but an interesting story for anyone who actually cares about the science. But who cares about science when we have heartstrings to tug on? So that is why we are dishonoring this National Geographic clunker that was, to be fair, promoted by a lot of different outlets, but National Geographic in particular, uh, back in December about these poor, starving polar bears who are dying because you are driving a car or whatever the implication is exactly. So to debunk this nonsense in... Uh, true fashion, let's go to an actual polar bear scientist. Imagine that. Susan Crockford of PolarBearScience.com, who notes with regards to this particular fake news story, quote, In August, this bear would have been only recently off the sea ice. Since most bears are at their fattest at this time of year, something unusual had to have affected his ability to hunt or feed on the kills he made when other bears around him did not starve and die. It could have been something as simple as being outcompeted for food in the spring by older animals. But if sea, lo sea ice loss due to man-made global warming had been the culprit, this bear would not have been the only one starving. The landscape would have been littered with carcasses. This was one bear dying a gruesome death, as happens in the wild all the time. There is no suggestion that a necropsy was done to determine cause of death, just like Sterling's bear that supposedly died of climate change. In fact, research done by polar bear specialists that work in the field showed that the most common natural cause of deaths for polar bears is starvation, resulting from one cause or another, too young, too old, injured, sick. Uh, so that takedown of this fake news story goes on and on and lots of very important details in that story so I suggest you'll go and read that the, of course the link will be in the show notes for this award ceremony an award ceremony with show notes that's right folks um, but uh, she does go on to ask a very important question that does not get asked in times like this which is namely why was there no concern or mass hysteria about mass starvation of the polar bears back in, say, the spring of 1974 in the eastern Beaufort Sea, when females with newborn cubs starved because there was too much thick spring ice driving away ringed seals uh, before they could give birth. Um, that was a case of mass starvation and really horrific scenes, much, much, many orders of magnitude more horrific than this single polar bear that's that everyone's crying over in December of 2017, but you didn't hear much of a peep about that at the time in the media because it just wasn't politically convenient at that time, and it certainly is 100% against the uh, global warming hypothesis of the only reason polar bears die is because of global warming. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. Um, so if you want... The word of a climate alarm, true believer, oh my god, man-made climate change is real, you're responsible, we're killing the, the earth, who still recognizes this particular polar bear story for a total crock of nonsense. I will direct you to Jeff W. Higdon, the Arctic seal specialist, who took the time out, um, d despite not really wanting to get involved in this, but he did take time out to specifically chide his fellow global warming alarmists for jumping on stories like this to tug on people's heartstrings and make them uh, feel bad about climate change when this has nothing to do with climate change. And he uh, tweeted out a series of tweets about this video and how it was being used and why it should not be used in the way that it is. And he said, for example, videos like this tug at heartstrings and aim for emotional responses, but they have significant potential to backfire because they make the deniers, well, those deniers, dig in even more, partly because over-the-top statements that accompany them are usually easy to pick apart. 
you don't say. So maybe you shouldn't be using lies to try to promote your truth. Wow, what an imaginative, what an incredible uh, idea there. Um, and after suggesting that he believed that the bear probably in the video, probably, although we can't know um, just from video, but probably had bone cancer, which was the, uh, the culprit for why it was uh, not doing so well. He then said what the photographer should have done had he actually cared about this polar bear and what actually caused its death, rather than simply waving your hand and saying it's climate change. Uh, he said what the Sea Legacy crew should have done was contact the GN conservation officer in the, great, in the nearest community and had this bear put down and necropsied. The narrative of the story might have turned out quite different if they had, end quote. Yes, yes, it might have, mightn't it? So rather than this fake news story where here's a video of a polar bear, climate change, maybe they could have actually done some science and determined what actually killed this polar bear and done a story on that. I think that would be actually interesting. I think that would be even potentially a valuable educational experience for a lot of people. But no, it's to serve a political agenda. So they just dashed it together and got soundly and trouncely uh, uh, denigrated throughout the media. As I say, CBC and all, all sorts of other places picked up on this and called it out for the fake news it was. So that's why this gets the fake eco scare of the year award the dino goes to National Geographic for their disgusting fake news reporting on this uh, fake story. So uh, the credit for that particular story goes to Lee Stewie, who did suggest that story in the uh, comment section of the announcements. So Lee Stewie, thank you for that. And I will be getting in touch with you for a DVD, a free corporate report DVD of your choosing for helping to nominate that story. Well, never fear. We have we have more dinos to give out today. <laughs> Quite a few actually. So, the second dino tonight is going to be <laughs> the award for the fakest fake interview to ever be faked, which is uh, quite a tall order, but Somehow or other, CNN managed to accomplish it. Yes, the fakest fake interview to ever be faked goes to CNN for Bana Alabed's full interview on the Syrian attack. Bana, do you blame President Assad for this? Yes. What is your message to President Assad? I am very sad. A lot of died, and no one helped them. The world is watching. The world doesn't do anything. What do you want the world to do? I want stop the war, and I want the the children of Syria play and go to school. Live in peace. We can, together, we can help them. Together, we can save them. I am trying my best to keep this award show lighthearted and whimsical, because if you can't laugh at this nonsense, what can you do? But honestly, I cannot watch that child abuse without getting outraged that little children are being used as nothing more than cynical pawns in this geopolitical game that is being played in front of our eyes. They are parading little children out to read off of teleprompters words they do not even understand, words they do not even comprehend, begging for people to come bomb their country to help save the poor children. It is disgusting that this happens. So... You'll forgive me if I don't laugh along at the stupidity of clips like this and the fact that they hate you so much that they want to insult your intelligence with this crap. I don't really find anything all that humorous about this. Uh, anyone with two functioning ocular organs and three functioning brain cells to rub together can see through this nonsense right away, but... For those who need a little help 
with that regard. Don't worry, there are still actual journalists in this world who actually go to places like Syria to find out the truth about stories like Bana Alabed's story. And trust me, I am not blaming Bana Alabed for the fact that she is being used cynically by her parents as a pawn in a geopolitical game. I put all of the blame on the parents and on all of the fake news media that enables this nonsense to be perpetuated. It is child abuse that's taking place right in front of your eyes, and it is enraging. So as I say, there are real journalists that are going around finding the truth about stories like that, thankfully. And one of them is Eva Bartlett, who I have had the chance to talk to on a couple of occasions, including specifically about this fake, staged, teleprompted, fake interview that we just witnessed. Speaking of children being used by their families for propaganda purposes, let's talk about Bana Alabed. Who on earth is this seven-year, valiant seven-year-old, eight-year-old, whatever she is now, uh, at Alabed Bana on Twitter? Uh, who is she? What, what is, what's her story? Well, I, I can't quote directly from her tweets because I'm blocked but um, by a seven-year-old. Well, she's now eight-year-old. But um, at the time when she opened her Twitter in... Um, Latish, like September or so 2016. She was a seven year old girl living in Eastern Aleppo and she started tweeting how she wanted peace and how, you know, Assad was bombing Aleppo. She tweeted something about Holocaust Aleppo and we need World War III. Um, she was presented to us as this child that was suffering in war and was tweeting about her life in amazingly good English for a seven year old girl, even if she was a native English speaker, I have to say. Um, and so it, after some time, like a month or two, her followers on Twitter um, skyrocketed to hundreds of thousands. And by the time that Aleppo was being liberated, um, she was tweeting along with a, other social media activists. Um, this may be my last tweet. You know, I don't know if I'll make it out alive. There was actually a Syrian journalist, Maitham al Askar, I think his last name is. And he was, I believe it was him. He was trying to get in touch with the family to say, look, we will guarantee you safe evacuation. Um, that's, I, I can't remember much more to his like investigation, but he basically deduced they were there in Eastern Aleppo, but they refused um, to be via him um, or by his contact safely evacuated. But in the end, anyway, when terrorist factions were taken from Eastern Aleppo and given safe military escort and passage to Idlib, so that's another point is the Syrian government honored its promise and the Russians to allow these terrorists, Al-Qaeda, to leave Aleppo and go to Idlib, and then they went on, most of them, to Turkey. Bana's family went with them. And Bana ended up in Turkey, um, met Erdogan, you know, took a nice photo with Erdogan, got Turkish citizenship. And while she was there, she was interviewed by um, a South African man, maybe with the Young Turks, um, don't quote me on that, but definitely a South African man who said, now Bana, you might not understand my English, so I will speak slowly, and you have, you know, your mother and someone else to help you. And his first question to loosen her up was, do you like the food in Istanbul? And she said, guess what? Save the no children of Syria. Which is a pretty strange answer. One more, I mean, one more time, sir. Save, save the children of Syria. To do you like the food in Istanbul? Then the guy followed up and he said, um, Anna, do you like Istanbul? And in the meantime, her mother said in Arabic, what do you like to eat, Bana? So she said to the end, to the question, do you like Istanbul? She said, fish. So this is a child we're meant to believe. But, but we saw her on CNN, Eva. We saw her speaking so naturally and not at all reading things that were not at all on a teleprompter in front of her. It was a natural conversation, honest. Right. And you know when she gave one of her natural um, please, video please to the world, and she walked up in Aleppo and she said, I'm so sad, it's so bad. She was literally standing um, meters from the main Al-Qaeda headquarters in either in northern Syria, certainly in Aleppo. And you know for a fact that Al-Qaeda isn't gonna let just anybody film and take photos. And the journalists that found this out, um, we have to commend Khaled Iskif. He's a journalist from Aleppo. He's dug into all of this. He found out that Bana's daddy, Ihsan, was a terrorist in the Al Safwa brigades. He was a military trainer. Um, he has a legal background, uh, which is what he proclaims on Twitter. He's a lawyer and um, for peace and I don't know what. 
Um, but he was working in one of the Sharia courts and deciding whether people die or not. And he was at one point um, working with, you know, Al Qaeda. And Bana's whole area was surrounded by Al Qaeda headquarters. So it's not conceivable to believe, um, especially given that the father's own notebook said that he worked as a military trainer and as, you know, in the Sharia courts, it's not conceivable that this family was not deeply embedded with terrorists. As you can imagine, no dearth of fake news stories making their way out of the Syrian propaganda front over the course of the past year. So if you're interested in some more of the deception that is going on around Syria, I suggest you check out the rest of that interview with Eva Bartlett or just check out her work in general. Um, and don't worry, Syria will be making another appearance on tonight's Real Fake News Awards. So... Congratulations to CNN and all of the other fake news dinosaur media outlets that perpetuated the Ben Alibed fraud, amongst others. You know what they are and who they are. You have earned this dishonor of this particular dino. All right, let's move on to the next dino for the evening. This is the fake UFO story of the year award, a very specific award that goes this year to the New York Times for Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program. Quote, in the $600 billion annual defense department budgets, the $22 million spent on the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program was almost impossible to find, which was how the Pentagon wanted it. For years, the Pentagon, the program investigated reports of unidentified flying objects. According to Depar Defense Department officials, interviews with program participants and records obtained by the New York Times. It was run by a military intelligence official, Luis Elizondo, on the fifth floor of the Pentagon's Sea Ring, deep within the building's maze. The Defense Department has never before acknowledged the existence of the program, which it says it shut down in 2012. But its backers say that while the Pentagon ended funding for the effort at the time, the program remains in existence. For the past five years, they say, officials with the program have continued to investigate episodes brought to them by service members while also carrying out other Defense Department duties. The Shadow Program, part of it remains classified, began in 2007, and initially it was largely funded at the request of Harry Reid, the Nevada Democrat who was the Senate Majority Leader at the time, and who has long had an interest in space phenomena. Most of the money went to an aerospace research company run by a billionaire entrepreneur and longtime friend of Mr. Reid's, Robert Bigelow, who is currently working with NASA to produce expandable craft for humans to use in space. On CBS's 60 Minutes in May, Mr. Bigelow said he was absolutely convinced that aliens exist and that UFOs have visited Earth. But the story only gets weirder from there, folks. Yes, well down towards the end of that article... Quote, under Mr. Bigelow's direction, the company modified buildings in Las Vegas for the storage of metal alloys and other materials that Mr. Elizondo and program contractors said had been recovered from unidentified aerial phenomena. Researchers also studied people who said that they had experienced physical effects from encounters with the objects and examined them for any psychological changes. In addition, Researchers spoke to military service members who had reported sightings of strange aircraft. We're sort of in the position of what would happen if you gave Leonardo da Vinci a garage door opener, said Harold E. Puthoff, an engineer who has conducted research on extrasensory perception for the CIA and later worked as a contractor for the program. First of all, he'd try to figure out what is this plastic stuff. He wouldn't know anything about the electromagnetic signals involved or its function. Excuse me, wait, what What did he say there about extraterrestrial alloys? They have confirmed, in effect, for the first time that these things exist according to, to what the program said, uh, that they have established a kind of reality to these objects that didn't exist before, that the government was standing behind. 
um, or at least this unit of the, of the Pentagon. Uh, they have, as we reported in the paper, some material from these objects that is being studied so that scientists can try to figure out what accounts for their amazing properties, uh, this uh, technology, these objects, wh whatever they are. Um, so they have made what some progress. What type of material? Uh, they don't know. They're studying it. But it's some kind of compound that they don't recognize. So a lot of questions still. <laughs> more, it, it, Not a lot of answers. More questions than answers. As we always know. have. Yeah, that's what I thought he said. Well, the absolute insanity of this of uh, this whole story is perhaps best encapsulated by the register in their typically tongue-in-cheek style uh, uh, article on the subject. Astroboffins say our solar system could have... Wait, stop. What? The U.S. government found UFOs? Quote, Our solar system may have been born from bubbles of material hurled from a colossal wolf rea type star, according to a theory published Friday. Scientists studying the origin of our system generally believe... No, wait, sorry, stop. You know 2017 has been a bonkers year when the New York Times reveals a classified $22 million U.S. military program to investigate UFOs, complete with grainy videos of possibly alien spacecraft and claims of finding out-of-this-world alloys, and no one even blinks an eye. Did you miss that report? Quite a few people did. It came out on Saturday. And everyone was distracted by politics, hackers, longing looks at 2018, Christmas shopping, we don't know. Just letting you know. Where were we? Oh yeah, the solar system. Scientists generally believe our system formed near a supernova, an exploding dead star that emits shock waves of energy and a shower of elements that kickstart the formation of a new star. As one of these protostars matures, leftover material in the shape of a disk clumps together to create planetesimals and eventually planets. That's pretty much how boffins think our system was created. Now, however, a bunch of physicists reckon... Look, okay, sorry, very cool research, but time out. This New York Times story. It was written by a couple of Pulitzer Prize winners and one of their colleagues. It feels like it should be significant, but what are we dealing with here? Blurry video and audio recordings of UFOs spotted by pilots in Navy F-A-18 Super Hornets? Is it just bollocks or what? This particular program was scrapped in 2012 after five years. Is it a convenient cash cow for aerospace research companies? Oh sure, we'll take a look at these UFOs. Here's our not inconsiderable invoice. On the surface, this NYT expose looks exciting, but just what exactly was proven by Uncle Sam's classified probe into UFO sightings? Anything? The videos look like a bug gut stuck on the Navy jet's sensors. Right, sorry, real science. Focus. So, these physicists have put forward an alternative scenario for the formation of our solar system, describing it in a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal this week. They point out that our system has an abundance of aluminum-26 and not a lot of iron-60, compared to the rest of the Milky Way galaxy. If the system was formed from a supernova, it would have a relatively rich amount of both isotopes. Yet, like a pale nerd, it is iron deficient. Vikram Dwaradis, co-author of the paper and a research associate professor in astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago in the U.S., said supernovae release both aluminum-27 and iron-56. So it begs the question of why one was injected into our solar system and the other was not. Hold that thought. Speaking of metals, these mysterious unknown alien alloys the U.S. government apparently found, it's freaking some people out. We're obviously not talking machined metal, right? Actual alien spacecraft parts landing on Earth? A f***ing wing falling off the back of an intergalactic lorry? No way. Where's the mass panic? No one's batting an island. These alloys have got to be just rocks from space. Flecks of metal from another corner of the galaxy littering our planet. Sorry, it's just too distracting right now. End quote. Uh, the uh, article goes on in such style. I'll let you read the whole thing, but... Uh, yes, it is a particularly perplexing and very strange story from any perspective. Uh, it certainly doesn't add up. Uh, no matter how you look at it, there is something that is obviously being occluded from our attention uh, when it comes to a story like this. And perhaps even just the cynical take that this may just be an excuse to funnel some money over to some aerospace company uh, that happens to be chummy chummy with Harry Reid may have some something to do with the reality of what's going on here. At any rate, the idea that this 
unknown alloy to science, this material from who knows where, somewhere else in the universe, an actual alien craft or pieces of thereof is being stored in a hangar by some Bigelow billionaire. It's just absolute insanity. So I think there's clearly some fake news going on here. It's just at what level? Um, but the thorough breakdown of this story goes to Corbett Report user Zix7, who was the one who nominated this story in the fake news announcements on the website, and he uh, puts it this way. They claim, tic-tac-shaped UFO with strange aura is moving with amazing speeds. Uh, the problem with the claim, this video was already on the internet for quite some years via Earth Files, and from Assange, WikiLeaks, the New York Times fake news apocalypse has reached perfection with a front page story claiming UFOs exist. No surprise to see CIA parapsychology Scientology frauds like Harold E. Puthoff involved and the most basic journalistic questions unasked. Explanation as given uh, via UFO researchers, uh, specifically Dark Journalist YouTube channel. The New York Times UFO story footage was the result of a training operation and actually only shows normal aircraft at a distance on infrared shot on gun cameras with a gimbal uh, revolving head is obviously being passed off as something exotic by insiders who should know better and mainstream journalists who are not consulting aviation experts. Uh, the shape and aura caused by infrared cam camera uh, being slightly out of focus, the speed is caused by the rotation of the camera. Uh, and uh, Zig Zevin goes on to say, I don't think this will be in the news soon, though. The Pentagon and CIA usually give us fake UFO stories, maybe to muddy the waters, maybe to market and control the story, maybe to check the reactions of the public. The amount of disinformation on the subject is already gigantic. More interesting incidents usually attract aggressive debunkers. They come up with usual swamp gas and Venus explanations. What is funny, though, is that now the secret is out that many UFO-related files and materials have been sent to Bigelow and kept secret. So credit to Zig Zevin for uh, nominating this particular story, which at any rate, at some level, is fake news. And the only question is, uh, for whose agenda is this particular story being played? And What's the long-term goal here? Is this meant to be some sort of red meat so people will bite and then they can debunk it or whatever it is? Whatever it is, there is something very strange going on with this story. I think it does deserve a fake news award. So here's your dino to the New York Times and their Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who barfed up that putrid turd of a story. All right, um, so credit to Zig Zevin for bringing that to our attention, and I'll get in touch about your free Corbett Report DVD. Now it's time for the award for Worst Piece of Fake News Promounded by Independent Media. And this award is going to go to every single one of the thousands of people who retweeted and liked and otherwise shared on social media the never-ending stupid fake Pentagon gif. Uh, and it just keeps getting stupider and stupider. Um, this is... Uh, it's a two-second gif file, gif if you prefer, uh, of a doctored video of the Pentagon supposedly showing a missile hitting the Pentagon. Uh, and even that, apparently, was too much for the fraudsters to show this time around. So what ultimately ended up making the rounds on Twitter that I had the misfortune to see a couple of uh, weeks ago was literally a uh, screenshot of that two-second GIF. It wasn't even the GIF itself, um, which is now making the rounds as if this is some some hidden Pentagon video that no one's seen for 17 years just suddenly appeared, and wow, it's proof positive. Here it is. Here's the, the video of the missile hitting the Pentagon. Case closed. Let's all forward it and say, oh my god, and, and put it out there as 9-11 truth. Because what could go wrong with promoting 9-11 truth based on a video you know nothing about, right, guys? Uh, I'm not going to call out anyone in particular on this, because, as I say, this was being shared widely. Uh, when I saw it making the rounds a couple of weeks ago, and not for the first time. Uh, people who have been watching The Corporate Report will know that I did the debunk of this three years ago, and I showed you how to debunk this stupid doctored video for yourself in about 60 seconds. 
Hello, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com with your thought for the day for the 5th of June, 2015. And I can't hardly believe it myself, but unbelievably enough, the old, long-debunked footage of the missile hitting the Pentagon, quote-unquote, is once again surfacing in the alternative media. So here we see an example of this that just popped up in the last few days. Do these recently released, then disappeared images show a missile hitting the Pentagon on 9-11? Must see leaked images may reveal missile impact rather than jetliner struck Pentagon on 9-11. So what do we have here? We have an image, a looped image of a few frames from a YouTube video that has been mirrored. So I don't know, make of that what you will, but here's a mirrored YouTube uh, video with a watermark that, remember, it's a mirror, so it should be over here on the left side of the screen, 0205. And we see something. Is it a missile hitting the Pentagon? Unbelievable. Earth shaking. What do we know about this video? Well, um, absolutely nothing. Uh, it's just a still images captured from a recently linked, then disappeared video. I don't know what that means, but uh, neither does the person who wrote this article. Source unknown. So it's from a YouTube video, but who knows where this came from. I guess we just have to throw our hands up. But thank God it's been released, and we now finally have the smoking gun proof of the missile hitting the Pentagon. Or do we? No, in fact, this is long debunked fake video, and we can go back... For example, to 2011, when it was being promoted on Veterans Today by Gordon Duff, senior editor, 9-11 video of missile hitting Pentagon leaked. You'll notice that this time, this version of the video has the 0205 watermark correctly, because of course this isn't a mirrored image, this is the the uh, the video itself. And uh, the, here we go, an extreme close-up of the uh, the actual missile hitting. There it is again. Wow, there's the, there's the Pentagon. Ooh. Look at that. Unbelievable. There it is again. Wow. So all the elements of this uh, video are here, the 0205 watermark. And according to Veterans Today, at the time of 2011, this was a recently leaked declassified video that uh, was going to be, that had been suppressed for 10 years. Just like in 2015, it's a recently leaked suppressed video, right? Well, how about this? If you go and search Cruise Missile Strikes Pentagon on YouTube, you're going to find this 2007 post of this exact same video and it's the exact same zip video 0205 watermark and let's note there's a white flash a sudden zoom out some digital glitch and then the missile hits please remember that sequence because it will come in yeah, handy in a moment. So it takes literally less than one minute to debunk this nonsense. Pentagon, aerial, footage, search. Scroll down a little bit. 35 millimeter stock footage of Washington, D.C. aerials. Uh, original video from Google. This is used for the fake missile Pentagon video. Well, that sounds interesting. Oh, there it is. 0205 watermark. Here's the exact same thing. This obviously still has the counter on because this isn't the purchased stock footage. This is the stock footage that stock footage companies put up online to get entice you to buy it. But if you uh, scroll around to the right part, you'll notice the exact same white flash slash zoom out and then the digital glitch. And here it comes, white flash, zoom out, digital glitch, right about here. There we go, zoom out, digital glitch, and oddly no missile hitting the Pentagon this time. Exact same footage, but this one has been crudely done in a video editor to insert a ridiculously fake image of a missile hitting the Pentagon. So unbelievably enough, this video just refuses to die and keeps surfacing again and again and again and again and again, being propounded by people in erstwhile 9-11 truth circles who either don't care about 9-11 truth or are actively working to subvert it by using lies to try to promote that truth. Easily demonstrable, easily debunkable lies. Uh, at any rate, as I say, this was promoted by many, many, many people on social media, so I'm not going to single anyone out this year, but rest assured, I will be looking for more examples of people promoting this disinformation nonsense in the coming year, and I will be awarding the dino directly to you by name if you are caught among the people forwarding this stupidity in the coming year. So this particular dino does not go to the dinosaur media, it goes to the alternative, the social media, the independent media, people out there who should know better but for some reason or other don't, propounding, propounding and promoting known fakery uh, in the name of 9-11 Truth. You deserve 
a dino because you should become a fossil over the course of this year. Um, so let's move on to the next dino. This is going to be the award for the fa fakest Russian fake news tracking service. <laughs> That's right, you, you might remember I did mention on the uh, channel the other day about the uh, SPLC hate tracker and its laughable nonsense, but unfortunately I'm sure you have seen in recent uh, months uh, some of the well, the way, the serious ways that this fake Russian fake news hysteria is starting to creep into everybody's online lives. And the best example of that is the email that I'm sure many people have either seen on uh, making its rounds on social media or perhaps have received uh, themselves, which is the email from tr Twitter warning you that you you have retweeted or followed a suspected Russian fake news account in the past year, and uh, we're getting rid of these accounts for your safety, um, which of course is an intimidation tactic. Daniel McAdams and others have been talking about this and have received it. Interestingly enough, I didn't receive any such email, so I guess I'm free and clear despite being on the proper not uh, list, which, uh, for people who didn't see, was recently exposed in stunning fashion, so I'll put the link in about the real roots of the Proper Not team and who they really are, um, finally unmasked, a very fascinating story. Um, but there you go, I guess I'm not, I, I, I'm not a Russian agent because I never received that, that uh, thing from Twitter, but what are they going on? Well, they're going on these fake news, these Russian Twitter bot tracking services, like Hamilton 68. Have you heard of Hamilton 68 yet? Uh, it has tasked itself with tracking Russian influence operations on Twitter, and Hamilton 68, as it styles itself, is the brainchild of the fake news neocon non-think tank, the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which itself is a bastard child of the military-industrial complex German Marshall Fund. Uh, so it displays activity from 600 monitored Twitter accounts linked to Russian influence operations. That's right, that's the official explanation. These are 600 Twitter accounts that are linked to uh, Russian influence operations. What does that mean? No one knows. It's just pulled out of their posterior, but uh, here they are helping identifying trending hashtags and topics on Russian, Russia bot social media. That's right, so they, they will find what these 600 Russian linked influence operation accounts are tweeting about and warn you about them. And I'm glad they did because I learned this week from Hamilton 68 that one of the top trending hashtags this week amongst the Russian influence peddlers is Grammys. <laughs> That's right. Oh no, I knew it. The Ruskies are taking over the music industry. Um, so it is absolutely stupid. It is ridiculous. Uh, and it has rightly been ridiculed by journalists and activists all over the the geopolitical map, um, including people who are even on board with this anti-Russian hysteria. As described by Brian McDonald in a post that was posted on ronpaulinstitute.org, Since the German Marshall Fund of the United States unveiled its Alliance for Securing Democracy, AFSD, I've resisted commenting simply because the lobby group's Hamilton 68 dashboard is too preposterous to merit serious analysis. It's been rightly ridiculed by journalists and activists who never tire of knocking the Kremlin. The portal purports to use 600 Twitter accounts linked to Russian influence efforts online to prove how Moscow is trying to sow seeds of doubt in the Western political system via the social network. However, the creators won't reveal the users concerned, and results seem to suggest they are mostly members of the U.S. alt-right and alt-left, meaning this is yet another attempt to pass off American descent as some Kremlin psyop, which is beyond ridiculous. Furthermore, the names behind AFSD betray the project's real purpose, to shift blame from internal American and European factors to the convenient Russian boogeyman, which, of course, suits its financial backers, including the State Department, NATO, and the ubiquitous weapons maker Raytheon, all of whom benefit commercially and politically from strained ties between Moscow and Washington. 
To achieve these goals, they've hired the usual roll call of reliably anti-Russia blowhards, including Estonian-American politician Ilvis Tumis and rent-a-quote talking head Michael McFall, the Mother Teresa of the Russia beat. Those two are joined by neoconservative windbag William Crystal and ex-CIA chief Michael Morell. The dashboard itself is helmed by a, a chap named J.M. Berger, who was apparently an expert on ISIS in the Middle East before discovering the Russia bashing gravy train this summer. This week, he's taken to the pages of Politico to explain his plaything. What follows is best described as an inept and an ignorant form of thrift store McCarthyism. Berger tells how his dashboard uh, displays the near real-time output of Russian influence operations on Twitter, something he calls Riot for short. And he cites things like RT's coverage of Vladimir Putin's recent pike fishing trip, a jaunt also prominently featured in the New York Times, the Daily Mail, and the Sun, which incidentally described Putin as a beefcake, meaning either Paul Dacre and Rupert Murdoch are Russian agents, or this contention is just farcical. End quote. Well, I'll let you decide which pertains there. Uh, yes, Hamilton 68, if you haven't heard about it yet, you should at least check it out for the laugh value of the trending Twitter hashtags that you must be afraid of because that's what the Ruskies want you to be thinking about. And again, it is obviously from American Twitter accounts. It's just American political dissent on the right and on the left to the one-party war state never-ending neocon agenda. Uh, uh, which is, of course, focused largely on making Russia into the boogeyman. The Russia hysteria obviously did not die down in 2017. It pertains very much to the fake news awards in general and their existence in the first place. So perhaps fitting that this particular dino is going to the Russia boogeyman fearmongers of Hamilton 68 and the German Marshall Fund for their contribution their disgusting contribution to the hysteria that is driving the world to the brink of a literal war that could kick off because people are so amped up about the fake news. Um, but why not? Why let a little truth get in the way of a good war, I suppose? Well, my friends, we could go on and on and on and on with fake news stories uh, from this past year, but I think we'll wrap it up with... The award that you have all been waiting for, the one that you've been waiting on the edge of your seat for, that's right. This is the award for the fakest fake news story of 2017. The T-Rex of all dinos goes to the single worst piece of fake news nonsense from the past year. And this particular dishonor goes to The Guardian for their article... How Syria's White Helmets Became Victims of an Online Propaganda Machine. I cannot do justice to just how utterly, disgustingly, putrid a job of journalism The Guardian and Olivia Solon did with this putrid article that they puked out in December uh, of 2017. So... I'm going to do something special for this worst fake news story of the year. I'm going to do an entire podcast episode refuting this piece of garbage journalism, piece by piece, flaying it to pieces in front of your eyes. That is the type of dishonor that this particular article deserves, and I'd like to thank the Guardian, and Olivia Solon for writing such a ridiculous, absolutely lamentable piece of non-journalism as this, because I, for a very long time, for years now, have been thinking I should do a piece on the White Helmets, I should do something about this, but I saw the work that Vanessa Beely and Eva Bartlett and 21st First Century Wire and others have been doing on this, for a very long time, and I think well, they're doing an excellent job of doing this. I, I'll leave it to them. Um, but thank you, Guardian, for giving me the kick in the butt that was needed for me to see that, no, I need to help spread the word about this as well. So congratulations, you have made a new enemy, and you are going to suffer the consequences of putting out 
disgusting and despicable lies about such an incredibly important issue. As I say, I could probably do an entire episode just about Syria fake news, and perhaps I will in the future, but this fake news story of the year takes the cake. If you have not read this story yet, please go and read it in preparation for our next podcast episode, which, as I say, will be a takedown of this propaganda nonsense. So thank you, Guardian and Olivia Solon, for writing the worst piece of fake news, journalism, so-called, of the entire year. You heartily deserve this particular dino. And that's going to do it for the awards ceremony for this evening. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of the putrid propaganda of the past year. And as I say, this is the first annual, so I do imagine this will be an ongoing thing uh, that we will be returning to year after year as the dino media and some of the alternative media also continue to pump out fake news. We will be here continuing to expose it. My hearty thanks to all of the Corporate Report members who did play along with their nominations. And as I say, all of the people who were mentioned specifically as nominating some of these stories, I will be in touch with you specifically about your choice for free Corbett Report DVD of your choosing. And uh, if you did not, if your nomination did not make it, don't worry. There is obviously many, as I say, many leftover stories. So I'm going to be writing in this weekend's uh, International Forecaster newsletter editorial. I'm going to be writing some of the honorable mentions of fake news stories of 2017. So you might want to stick around for that, including some that didn't quite make it, they were in 2016 or 2018, so uh, we'll go over some of the honorable mentions this weekend. I hope you'll be there to join me for it. I am, once again, James Corbett, broadcasting from the palatial broadcasting studios of the Corbett Report here in Western Japan. Thank you for your time. Looking forward to doing this again with you next year. So it dawned on me at the end of last year that I'd never used the Twitter poll function. And I thought to myself, what better way to use the poll function than to engage in that holy sacrament of the statist religion, selection. I mean, election. Yes, have a vote. Everyone likes voting. It gives them the illusion of control, right? That is exactly what every election is like, selection. They cloak themselves in whatever cloak looks good to the public, and then they uncloak themselves after they get into power. It happens again and again and again and again and again from Syriza in Greece to everyone else. They all betray whoever voted them into power for whatever transitory reasons. That was the point. And so I'm glad that this uh, selection became a dumpster fire of sorts because that's exactly what it was intended to do. That's what all selections are intended to do. Remember, the real power is not in voting harder. The real power is in taking matters into your own hand, deciding what you will do each and every day. You vote every single day with how you choose to spend your time, what you spend your money on, who you spend, uh, who you befriend and who you shun. All of that is your vote that you make every day. And those are the votes that matter, not casting ballots for a politician. Anyway, I'll leave the link in the show notes from the sunny climes of Western Japan. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.